If you would turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3, uh, verse, starting in verse 1, uh, we're going to move through a few scriptures here quickly in the beginning. And um, see where God takes us from there. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. Talking today about the importance of repentance. The importance of repentance. Matthew 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. For this is that which was spoken of the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. John the Baptist begins... His earthly ministry preaching the simple message of repentance. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. A prerequisite to the coming of the kingdom of God was repentance. Before the kingdom could be revealed, there had to be a people whose hearts were repentant and turned towards him. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17 Jesus is fresh out of his wilderness 40-day fast. He is fresh off of temptation by Satan himself. He leaves the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus, God Incarnate God manifest in flesh, walking this earth, experiencing this this human struggle, walking and facing every temptation that we face. He begins his ministry preaching. Repent. Acts chapter two and verse thirty eight, a verse that most of us in this room have committed to memory. Then Peter said unto them, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In those three verses, we've seen that John the Baptist, the greatest among the prophets, so called by Jesus himself, we've seen God manifest in the flesh. We've seen God's chosen apostles at the founding of the church. They all preach this similar or very same message, rather, of repentance. Repentance is not just a New Testament thing either, for there are 45 times in your Old Testament where the word repent or repentance is used. An interesting sidebar to that would be the fact that a sizable portion of those are referring to a divine change of direction or a divine change of mind. God himself in fact, is saying, I repent of what I thought to do. Heaven puts a very large premium on repentance. In Luke chapter 15 and verse 7, after telling the parable of the 99 and the 1, Jesus says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over 99 just persons which need No repentance. He's giving us a glimpse of the mindset of heaven, of the the, the, the focus of heaven, the thought process of heaven is there is a value that heaven places when somebody makes up in their heart and in their mind, I am going to repent, I'm going to turn towards God. Now, before we can discuss the importance of repentance, we have to stop and discuss sin. So what is sin? Sin could be described as the voluntary departure of a moral agent from morally correct behavior or thinking. We define morally correct behavior or thinking by the word of God, by referring or referencing the nature of God. 
by referring and referencing the creation of God, his spirit speaking in us. And last, but certainly not least, the conscience that God has placed inside of each of us. God has put inside of every person under the sound of my voice a direction, a guiding system that is going to help you. It's going to assist you in doing righteousness. That's your conscience. Now, sin can be active. There can be an active participation in sin. There is a known divine law that I'm violating. That's active sin. I am I am doing this either by ignorance or by choice. I'm choosing with a known divine law to violate it. I know that lying is a sin. And so when I choose But by my own ability, being a moral agent, God put inside of me something that's different than an animal. I'm different than a dog. I'm different than a cat. I'm different than any any other being on this earth. I have a moral agency about me. I am able to make these decisions. And so when I choose to voluntarily depart from a known divine command, I am sinning against God. Now, sin can be inactive or passive. When I neglect to fulfill commands, again, either by ignorance or by simply not doing what I know to be commanded of me, I'm sinning. James put it this way in James chapter 4 and verse 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, sin is not referring to the actions only, but sin begins long before action begins. Sin addresses or permeates our attitudes, our thoughts, the motives of our heart. That's why the first and greatest commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If we could ever strive towards that commandment, to reach that place, there's no room in our life for sin. There's no room in our mind for either active or passive resistance against the word and the will of God. Now, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 14, anything not of faith is sin. Now, to violate God's word, obviously, we've settled and established it. It is sin. To violate the conscience that God has placed down inside of us is sin. To step out of the word of God is sin. You see, it addresses the attitudes and thoughts of our heart. A great scripture for that, if you needed one, could be in Matthew chapter 5, where in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is addressing the, the concept of adultery. You've heard it said of old, if a man committeth adultery or lieth with a woman, he's, he's committing adultery. But I say unto you, If a man even look at a woman with lust in his heart, you see, sin can begin long before the action or the inaction takes place. Sin begins long before we begin to see something on the outside. There's something inside of us that is sinful. To understand it more deeply, let's go all the way back to the beginning in Genesis chapter three, starting in verse one. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now that phrase, neither shall ye touch it, we have no record of God saying that. It's supposed that perhaps Adam added that boundary, added a place to help his wife to not reach out and touch the tree. But Adam perhaps drew a line. Whatever the case, the command was don't eat of it. And now Eve understands that there's also a a prohibition against touching it. If we would allow our pastor to help us like Moses at the mountain to begin to draw some guidelines and some boundaries around our life, there would be a guardrail. There would be more safety in your life. The serpent said unto the woman, you're not going to die. Now, this is a partial truth. But it was still a lie. And it was still falsehood. 
he goes on and says, for God knows in the day that you eat of it, then your eyes shall be open. You shall be as God's knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the the tree was good for food. There's a progression here, and we're going to talk about that progression in just a moment. She saw that the tree was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes. It desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. Those two words have always made me very curious. Adam was with her. Was he standing right next to her while the serpent was talking? I don't know. But it always makes me curious. Did she have to run across the garden and say, hey, Adam, you got to try this? The eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. We talked about this quite a bit on on Wednesday night. They heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. We see in the pattern of Adam and Eve. The very first time that sin has entered into mankind, the results of sin are now displayed in the following verses. A connection, a friendship, a closeness that they had with God. The moment that sin entered the picture, God was still looking for them. But even in their own guilt and shame, they understood, I cannot be in the presence of a holy God. I cannot any longer walk with him like I used to walk with him. And so instead of running to the voice of God, like Adam and Eve did of old, when God would come down and walk with them in the garden, in the cool of the day, now they're hiding from God. They're hiding from the presence of God. And the Lord calls unto Adam and says, where are you? An omnipotent God knows exactly where they were, but he's giving Adam a moment. He's giving Adam an opportunity to step out and say, God, I'm right here. This is what's happened. And Adam says in verse 10, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid. Sin will cause fear at the voice of God. Sin will cause us to run from the presence of God, to hide ourselves in darkness, to hide ourselves in the shadow. And what should have brought joy, what should have brought peace, what should have brought comfort to Adam instead brought him fear. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he, God, said to him, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Again, here's an omnipotent God asking questions that he knows the answer to. God knows whether or not Adam and Eve have eaten of the tree. He's giving Adam an opportunity to say yes. But look at what man does. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree And I did eat. And the Lord says then to the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. The pattern established from the very beginning when sinful nature first enters into mankind is that we have an unwillingness to own up to take personal responsibility for what we have done to sin against God. When our great, great granddaddy, Adam, was confronted by God uh, and God asks him a question that he obviously knows the answer to, Adam is desperate to have the piercing vision of God's gaze uh, off of him. And he says, "Um, uh, the woman that you gave me. Can you imagine he first points his finger at his wife, which is bad enough for any married person in this room already. If you've ever tried to pawn something off on your spouse, you know that's not going to end well. But realizing that it's not going to be enough, Adam now points that finger back at God and said, you gave her to me, Lord. The woman now, the focus of God's attention, the one who's receiving all of God's omnipotence and all of his knowledge, she's looking around frantically for somewhere to hide and someone to blame. And so she says the serpent, it it was the serpent's fault. The devil made me do it. It's a tried argument, but it's a tired argument. It did not work then. 
and it will not work now. Our sin cannot be pawned off on somebody else. Our sin cannot be pushed back onto the hands of God to say, God, uh, you're the one that put me into this circumstance. You're the one that put me into this circumstance uh, or situation. We, We can't say the devil made me do it. You see, we have all sinned, as Romans 3 and 23 says, and come short of the glory of God. Wherefore, Romans 5 and 12 As by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Romans 6 and 23, Paul is progressing throughout his argument. If you ever want a deep course of study, dive into the book of Romans and try to grasp with full understanding the the absolute breadth and depth of the argument that Paul is, is making. It's an actual literary masterpiece. Read it and begin to understand this, this, this problem of sin that has entered into us. And Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, Paul writes, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wages are earned by actions and deeds. Our sin has earned us death by sin. Our great granddaddy, Adam, gave us a sinful nature, but you committed the sin on your own. Now, I like the way that my apostolic study Bible put it. It said sinful acts condemn us, but they are only a symptom of our root problem, which is a sinful nature. You see, we might be able to adjust behavior enough where we feel like we're no longer sinning actively, but there still exists within us a sinful nature that we cannot destroy or take care of on our own. The deepest problem, the root of the problem, is that there is now a depraved nature inside of us that is contrary and fighting against the kingdom of God, and we needed a a Savior to deal with it. But the gift of God is eternal life. See, a gift is freely given. Our salvation is a gift that we cannot earn. I cannot attain it. I cannot do enough good deeds. I can't give enough to charity. I can't help enough kind old ladies cross the street. I can't shine enough shoes. I can't vacuum the church enough times to earn the salvation of God. We look again at that progression of sin in James chapter 1, starting in verse 13, reading now from the New Living Translation where he says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when... Lust hath conceived it, bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And he finishes his thought with this phrase, do not err, my beloved brethren. It's a admonition that calls out to us even in this 21st century. We cannot think that somehow between the first century church and this 21st century world and context that we live in, that somewhere along the line, the clear commands of Scripture became less important and the clear mandates from heaven changed somewhere and God uh, suddenly became just this all-forgiving, overlooking God. But no, uh, He still demands what He demanded then. Do not err, my beloved brethren. There's a progression to sin because it springs from the lusts of our sinful nature in the New Living Translation, which I thought I was reading, but it turns out that was the King James. I don't know how that made it into my notes, but it translates the word as desires. If you remember our Sunday school lesson just a couple of weeks ago, we we learned that when we delight ourselves also in the Lord, he will begin to give us the desires of of our heart. But when we do not delight ourselves in the Lord, we are led astray. We are led toward sin by those desires in our heart. Our lusts are brought to conception, whether through action or through internal 
thought, internal attitudes, internal mindsets. You see, you could sit on these pews with nobody ever being the wiser about it, but still have unrepented sin in a life that needs to be addressed. The Bible says that some men's sins are more obvious and they precede them into judgment. But there are other sins that are are more well kept. They're more quiet. They're harder to discern. They're internal. And those will confront us in front of him. You see, when lusts are brought to conception, it brings forth sin. And the end of the progression is that sin inevitably leads to death. If it were just physical death, which is what Satan was talking about. He said, you're not going to die. He was speaking of a physical death. If it were only physical death, that would be one thing. We could live this life out and and know that there was sin, but at the end of it all, it's just physical death. But it is something far worse than just physical death. Our sin earns for us as it grows and it festers and it gets larger and it progresses. It earns for us an eternal death. Forever separated from the presence of God, forever separated from the joy and the peace and the love that's available in him. The power of repentance is in its ability to interrupt and completely derail this progression of sin in our lives. At any point prior to physical death, repentance can and will completely arrest the leavening effect of sin. You can step off the broad road that leads to destruction at any point uh, and step onto the straight and narrow by the simple and yet painful act of repentance simply by saying uh, I was wrong God uh, and I'm sorry Uh, and at that point in our lives uh, that progression of sin that's pushing us closer and closer to eternal death is arrested it gets the attention of God uh, and God's power rushes to a situation uh, and that sin that we could not overcome uh, is now stopped immediately in its tracks Now, this is a lot harder than it sounds. Because your sinful nature, my sinful nature, your carnal man has a survival instinct. He's got a fight or flight response. And if in the moment he thinks, you know what, I can't win this battle, I'm just going to take off. Don't worry, he'll come back. If he thinks he can take you, he's just going to rise up right there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You go to a prayer meeting and your flesh is just like, "Uh uh-uh, we're not praying today. We're not doing this. There's a carnal man inside each of us that has a survival instinct. He wants to survive as well. Uh, He wants to live in his own plans and his own ideas and his own thoughts just as much as your spirit desires to be knit with God. Now, it is not God's desire or design for sin to claim anybody's life. It is not God's desire to separate himself from his creation for eternity. Ezekiel 33 and 11 reads, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why? Will you die, O house of Israel? And so, repentance. What Adam and Eve never seemed able to do. Repentance is to feel and express sorrow or contrition for thoughts or actions. Repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry I got caught. You see, we, we've all been in that circumstance where the effects of our sin were visible more immediately and we, we experienced, we felt contrition because we felt the effects of our sin. Now, that sorrow and that grief may lead you towards a place of true repentance, but sorrow that I got caught is never enough on its own to affect a change of our circumstance. We must have a sorrow and a grief that our sin was an offense 
towards God. We must have a sorrow, not that I'm in legal trouble or not that I'm in marital trouble, but rather that I have sinned against God. You see, repentance also, I believe, has somewhat of a progression to it. We recognize our sin. We confess that sin to God. We feel and experience contrition or godly sorrow for that sin. And the effort of all of that is to bring us to a place where we make a decision to forsake sin. Proverbs 28 and 13 would be a fantastic portion of Scripture to commit to memory. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. There's a a two-part thing to do here. There's a confession towards God uh, with a true attitude of sorrow in our heart. And then there's a forsaking, there's a turning away from it. 1 John 1 and 9, New Testament entering into the new covenant. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's important that we understand the value of repentance because repentance is able to cleanse all uh, unrighteousness. Repentance provides us with a constant course correction. Every time that I mess up, any time my attitude gets off course, any time that carnal nature rises up and I allow it for whatever reason or there's something unaddressed in my life that I'm not quite aware of and not able or, or knowing to take out yet and that rises up and, and it begins to conceive and it leads me to sin, repentance provides me with a method to get back into alignment with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It provides me with a way to correct my course and turn it back on to that straight and narrow path that God uh, has laid out in His Word. Now close, close isn't good enough. If you were on a rocket going to the moon, everybody's familiar with degrees, right? As a system of measurement, there's 360 degrees in a circle. There's 360 degrees of your compass. If you were progressing towards the moon on a rocket and you were off by one degree, doesn't seem like a big deal, right? Like one degree off. Uh, If you're at your house and your thermostat is usually set at 70 and you've got it set at 69, most people can't tell the difference between 69 and 70 just by sitting in the room. Over one mile... You're only off by 92 feet. That's not so bad. 92 feet, one mile, one degree. But by the time you travel the distance required to go to the moon, you'd never get there. You'd be off by 4,169 miles. Judas was awfully close to Jesus. Judas seemed to be walking the same path that everybody else was walking. He he was there when Jesus fed the multitudes. He was there when Jesus opened the eyes of the blind. But somewhere along the line in Judas's life, he got off perhaps just by one degree. And by the time that it was discovered, Judas is not just 92 feet off and able to run back to the feet of Jesus. He's 4,169 miles off course. The importance of repentance is this, that earlier is better. It's easier to course correct 92 feet than it is 4,100 miles. It's easier when we're still at this stage of realizing that there's something offensive to God inside of my heart instead of allowing that to grow and to remain and to fester. uh, Every day I bring myself to a place of repentance. Every day uh, I bring myself to a place of examination and allow God uh, to begin to perform surgery on my heart. It's a lot easier to get a small lymph node uh, than it is a large cancerous mass. uh, And that's exactly what sin becomes if we allow it to remain in our lives. 
Deal with it daily instead of waiting until the problem becomes so evident. Uh, But I say again, your carnal man inside of you, he wants to survive. Uh, He does not want to be drugged to the cross and nailed to it. He does not want to uh, do as Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, mortify uh, the deeds of the body. He's got no desire to die. One more portion of Scripture or two more portions that are closely tied together as we close. We watch this play out in an extreme example in the Word of God. In 2 Samuel chapter 11. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And watch this progression. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. David has not committed sin at this point. He's on the roof of his house. He's walking. His eye saw it. He is not sinful at this point. And the woman was very beautiful, not to see, but to look upon. So now David progresses into a place where he allows his eye to linger, where his eye had no business being would to God that David had simply said, whoa, hey, we got to get that lady some shelves or or some fencing around the top of her house. We got to get her something. Lord, please help my heart. God, help me to remain pure. I will set no wicked thing before mine. eye." but instead that lust that was within David conceives. And David now realizes, man, she's pretty good looking. I'm going to spend some time looking upon her. But it's not enough that there's an attitude inside of him. Now, verse 3 says, David sent and inquired after the woman. He's drawing ever closer to it. And one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? And David now knows not only that she's beautiful to look upon and who she is, but now he goes even one step further because uh, I don't think two, three, four, one day ago, David would have ever dreamed of doing this. But that uh, is the problem of sin is that it will always take us farther than we want it to go. It will always rush us down that road of progression uh, a whole lot faster than we realize towards death. And now David sends messengers and takes her to himself and she comes in unto him and he lay with her for she was purified from her uncleanness and she returns unto her house. And the woman conceived. It might as well say, and David's sin conceived and sent and told David, I am with child. As the story plays out, death was realized. First, Uriah, the husband. David, in a desperate attempt as his carnal man, did not want to face responsibility. Just like his great-grandfather Adam, uh, he did not want to have everybody know uh, the nakedness and the openness of his sin. So he puts Uriah to death. And then God takes the baby. A course correction would have been far easier when he's still standing on the roof of his house. Uh, but now we find David uh, fasting for several days, laying before the Lord, weeping, not dressing himself, trying to pray and pray, God, spare this child. He's confronted by Nathan the prophet and Nathan the prophet boldly points his finger at a king that could separate his head from his shoulders and says, Thou art the man. And in that moment, David was confronted with the same choice that all mankind has. Now, you've probably never committed murder in this room. And very few, if any of us in this room, have ever probably committed adultery. We've never tried to cover up those two things. But sin is sin. Whether it's a white lie or whether it's murder, whether it's manslaughter or whether it's just being dishonest with somebody, it's still sin and it still progresses towards spiritual death. He faced the same question that all mankind has always faced. What do I do with this sin? 
And David answers the correct way. I believe this is a large part why Acts chapter 13 calls David a man after God's own heart. Because David did not take the route that Adam and Eve took. David did not take the route that so many others have took. David stood before the prophet who was pointing his long finger at him and said, I have sinned against the Lord. You see, without that admission of guilt, without that acknowledgement of my sin, repentance is going to be powerless. If if you have a victim mindset and mentality, well, it's this person's fault. It's it's not my fault. It's the way I was raised. You're never going to see the power of repentance realized in your life. And I fear you're never going to effectively have those sins remitted from your life. And David penned perhaps what is one of the most beautiful portions of Scripture. We know it to be in reference to this specific event. In Psalm chapter 51, as I close, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. I I believe David to be saying there, I have a constant reminder that I've messed up. I've got a constant reminder that I've done wrong. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, uh, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward part and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me, with the hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And here's the ultimate joy of repentance again. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones that thou hast broken may rejoice. You see, there may be some things that enter into your life, some hard times that come into your heart that God will allow to bring you back to a place of repentance, to bring you back to a place of fellowship, some painful circumstances, those broken bones, if they're leading us back to God, if they're leading us to a place of repentance, they should be a broken bone that can cause us to rejoice. He goes on and says, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. And now uh, the portion of scripture that many of us are familiar with, create in me, O God, uh, a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence. Don't don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Uh, The importance of repentance is uh, that when there's sin in our life, we will never, ever be able to walk in the joy of the Lord. Uh, When there's unrepented sin hanging out in my heart, uh, I will forever be walking in guilt and shame. Uh, I'll forever be walking in condemnation. I'll forever be walking uh, with this knowledge that I'm not right with God. Then... Will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto me, unto thee. Deliver me, God, uh, O God of my salvation. My tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips and my mouth shall show forth praise for thou desirest not sacrifice. Else would I give it. You don't delight in burnt offerings, but the sacrifices of God as we stand are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Now, I'm not trying to take the place of Pastor Mark today as he leads us to communion together. But for the next few moments, I'd like if we could pause. You see, repentance is not our pit stop on the way to greater things. It's not just a a quick thing that we want to rush through in the altar so that God can fill somebody with the Holy Ghost. 
It's an absolutely essential component of our salvation. It works together with water baptism in Jesus' name to bring about complete forgiveness and remission of our sin. But it's important that we live a life of repentance. God help us if we're ever too big to humble ourselves and repent. It's a lot easier, my friend, to correct an attitude in our heart than it is to correct an action that is the result of that attitude. Uh, David was never able again to have peace in his family because of the result of his sin. Uh, Yes, the eternal consequence was lifted off. David deserved to die a death of stoning according to the law of God. He should have been drug out in the street and stoned to death, but God showed him mercy. There may still be some earthly result of your sin, but repentance will bring about the complete removal of the guilt of that sin off of your life. Hear me right now in the Holy Ghost. Sin will shatter your ability to ever do what Hebrews 4 and 16 says to come boldly before the throne, but repentance will restore your access to the king. Later in this service, we're going to hear an incredible message on a time of communion where we remember the body and the blood of Jesus. But briefly before that, if we could lift hands all across this room and allow God to investigate us. I encourage you right now, my friend, uh, if anything has sprung to your mind during this lesson this morning, uh, course correct now. Uh, Don't be off by a degree. Uh, Don't leave this building off by a degree, but address it now. Uh, God, uh, create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit in me. Oh Lord, uh, I don't want to be cast away from you. I want to walk with you. Uh, I want to talk with you every day, God. Uh, Shine the light of your word into my life. Uh, Illuminate my heart, God. Uh, I'll correct it now. Uh, I'll correct it now. Uh, I don't want my sin to conceive. Uh, I don't want my sin to be brought forth. Uh, In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. You're never too big. You're never too mature to repent. And the sooner you do it, the better off you're going to be. If there is known scriptural dictate that you're violating, it's got to be a course correction. It's got to be addressed because every day that we do it is taking us further and further away from the throne of God. But the beauty of it is it may have taken us 20 years for that sin to grow to the giant cancer that it is, but one moment of sincere repentance will usher us right back into the throne room of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's no 20 year process to remove. Now there might be some effects of that sin, the lingering effects inside of our sinful nature that God is rooting out and stones that he's digging out of our lives. But our relationship, our connection with him can be restored in one moment. God uh, will allow us to again come boldly before his throne.